you go back to record, yeah? Hello and welcome everybody to the Smart Semiotics session on Zoom and later on YouTube. My name's Chris Arning, I'm Head of Creative Semiotics and I'm delighted to present, present today's session where we will be showcasing our speaker, Marcel Danese, Professor Emeritus of Semiotics in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. Now, I know Marcel fairly well. Um, he's a prolific author. He's an inspiring lecturer. He's someone that um, I was lucky enough to study with back uh, on a study sabbatical back in 2005, Marcel. Can you imagine? 19 years ago. And I'm delighted that um, he's still writing and inspiring everybody. Today, Marcel will be speaking to us on the topic of the semiotics of the dragon and other celestial signs. Um, and I'm sure all of those Zodiac fans, those who even maybe wouldn't want to admit that they check their Zodiac every day, they will be fascinated to know the genealogy of this sign system and the historical antecedents of the Zodiac. And I know that Marcel will be play, placing special attention on the symbolism of the dragon, which is obviously a very important sign. Um, we have members from around the world. It has many different connotations in different parts of the world. Um, I will then be introducing our discussants. Among them on the call today, we have Rukmini Bayanaya, we have Monica Rector, we have Hongbing Yu, Gregorius Pashaladis, uh, Pashalidis, sorry, Piotr Sadovsky, um, Evripidis Sandidis, and um, Panchanan Mohanty. We may have others joining us. Um, each discussant, discussant will have a short time um, to ask their questions. Uh, they will be formulating their questions during Marcel's uh, talk. And then um, after he's finished, uh, we'll call all discussants off mute to pose their questions. Marcel will take some notes and then he will respond at the end. Does that sound every good to everybody? Great, because that's what we've got for you today. Um, I'd also um, also to say that although only panel members will have question time with Marcel, all participants who are joining us and welcome to uh, you wherever you are, will have an opportunity to ask questions via the chat link. So please do um, use the Q&A function and um, if we have time, we will go to some of those. So um, I will be introducing discussants uh, as they come off mute. Um, so forgive me for just mentioning your name for now. But now it's all about the man of the moment. Um, Professor Marcel Danese, over to you, Marcel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for that. Wonderful. I'm sorry, one very quick one. I'd just like to give you um, a time, time warning at 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then I'll give you a two minutes after that. Over okay. to you. Uh, let me say from the outset that I'm neither an astrologer nor a believer in the Zodiac. I'm an outsider, an observer. That I actually became quite fascinated with the whole idea of astrology and Zodiacs and why they're still around today. So I'm coming from that angle. I'm not an expert. I found so many things by online research of actually going to online Zodiacs and people using them. There's so much to say that... Um, I hope after this presentation, um, I'm already drafting chapters to put things together into a book length form. Also, because I haven't found very much work in semiotics in this field. So that's the angle I'm coming from. I will be reading to be sure I don't digress. As you know, Chris, I tend to digress and I do not want to do this. It's too important of a topic. So can I have the outline, uh, Big New? And... Here's how I will follow and I will announce each part. There'll be a small introduction. I will then discuss in schematic form the origins and evolution of the two types of zodiacs, the Western and the Chinese. I will give an overall semiotic interpretation and then I will discuss connections between astrology and medicine, astrology and love, and then insert everything within what may be called a cosmic consciousness as opposed to other forms of consciousness, including semiotic consciousness, which may overlap. Then I will look at really the point of arrival, to my surprise, the resurgence of astrology today, then a few concluding remarks. Okay, I will start. As you might know, this is the year of the dragon, according to Chinese astrology. 
unlike European mythical traditions where the dragon is imagined as a winged fire breathing reptilian monster who brings chaos into the world in China, it is imagined contrary wise as a bringer of order and good fortune. Now, the question of why such fantastical signs and the mystical belief systems they unfold continue to resonate with modern day people is a truly fascinating one and may bear larger implications psychologically and socially, living in an era where social media and predictive algorithms can deliver customized personal horoscopes and instantaneous astrological predictions at the touch of a screen. A 2023 survey published by the consulting firm Oliver Wyman Forum in the US found that Gen Z, the generation born in the year since 1996, raised on social media is 83% more likely to say that astrology has helped improve their own lives compared to those in other age groups. Now, astrology is an ancient divinatory craft, but the fad of daily predictive horoscopy came about for the first time in 1930 as a gimmick by the British newspaper, the Sunday Express, which wanted something showy in its pages after the birth of Princess Margaret. An astrologer was hired and he predicted in that issue that, quote, events of tremendous importance to the royal family and the nation, end of quote, would happen. The column generated significant sales and thus was born modern pop horoscopy, a pseudo zodiacal craft that is in a fundamental way, a betrayal of the original objectives of astrology as a blend of metaphysics, cosmology and divination. Now, to fathom why horoscopy has resurfaced as a pop culture phenomenon, my aim is to look at the zodiac as a self-contained, unfalsifiable sign system, uh, to paraphrase Karl Popper, focusing on what, what might be going on in the modern mind as it interprets zodiacal signs in, in contrast to what they likely liked in, according to some texts that I consult and including Ptolemy, signified in antiquity focusing on the differences and similar similarities between the Western and Chinese zodiacal systems in general. A premise that I have pursued throughout is that astrology emerged to give a specific mathematical, astronomical, geometrical codification to a metaphysical conundrum, the role of humans in the larger scheme of things. As such, it put, it put forth a model of the human condition, which envisioned human life as governed not solely by the deities, as it was in the early cosmogonic myths, but by the same physical forces that govern nature and the cosmos. A secondary premise I have followed is that over time, the zodiacal component of the astrological code came to be used as a personified life guide based on birth details and their interrelationship with impersonal life forces. I will use the term Western astrology in a broad way as the system originating in Babylon, but which spread to other countries and cultures where it was adapted culturally and philosophically. Babylonian astrology was one of the earliest conceptual systems positing a structural similarity between the human condition and astral phenomena. Now, although Western astrology witnessed a sharp decline after the Enlightenment, its resurgence today as pop astrology, even if largely spurious, begs some important questions, which I aim to address at the end from an interpretive angle, focusing on the broader cognitive and social processes that it might be mirroring. Okay, origins and evolution. The dragon sign, like uh, the other Chinese zodiac signs, uh, I'll need that uh, in a little bit, <laughs> Just bringing, but keep it there, it's okay. <laughs> um, according to which Yudi, uh, well, actually the, the sign derived from an ancient legend, according to which Yudi, or Yudai, the primordial god, held a race competition to determine which animals would be included in the calendar according to their placement in the race's outcome. The winner of the race was the mouse, who was consequently assigned the first year in the calendrical 12-year cycle. 
and the other 11 winners were inserted in the order of their placement in the race. This is traced to the Zhang Wo period in the 5th century BCE. Chinese astrology is coincident with the origins of Chinese philosophy. They're inseparable to this day, both based on the view that the three harmonies, heaven, earth, and human, and the principles of yin and yang are in a metaphysical symbiotic relation. The main difference between Western and Chinese zodiacs is that the former is based on deciphering the meanings of the configuration of celestial bodies at an individual's time of birth, and in the Chinese, on the date of birth itself within 12 year cycles. I'm glad I've got Hong Bing here, <laughs> who can help me out with some of the details. Anyhow, the Chinese zodiac assigns an iconic animal sign to a year. So the dragon, for instance, which is an imaginary um, mythical animal, is placed in a set of years in the calendar separated by a factor of 12. 1976, 1988, 2000, and so on to 2024. The Western signs are instead iconic representations of animal or mythological personages forms based on isomorphic configurations of stars in the sky. So the Aries sign, and now you can show that as being you the, um, the next, um, uh, yeah, the Aries sign, which stands for the ram, is related to the astronomical constellation, also called Aries, because its stellar objects can be connected geometrically as vertices in a diagram that reveals the outline of a ram figure. The main structural philosophical similarity between the two zodiacs is that of cyclic recurrence, which is why the 12 signs of both are placed in a circle or almanac type wheel. I will come back to the interpretive meanings of these signs um, shortly. For now, it is sufficient to look and, and to note that the placement of the signs, as you can see in the Western Zodiac, is in the circle. And in this case, there are concentric circles. The months are in the inner circle. This is uh, something that goes back about 150 years. I can't remember the exact date of this one. Um, there are other forms of it. But this seems to uh, bear most of the information that certainly I'm interested in. <laughs> and yeah, you've got the months specified in the inner circle surrounded by the first concentric circle, the, um, the, the signs themselves, but in outline form, schematic form. And above the other concentric circles are the actual animal or mythological signs fully depicted. Next one, um, next slide. In the Chinese zodiac, as you can see, you still have the circle, but it's like spokes of a wheel, uh, and they are allocated within the 12 spokes, um, which form 12-year sets. So if you um, locate the dragon, say it starts in 1976, 98, 2000, and on till today. So the Western zodiac, as I mentioned, is traced to Babylon around the 3rd century BCE, spreading to Greece and India and other cultures search shortly thereafter. In India, as I found out at the beginning here, um, there was much adaptation and other um, animal forms and signs have been uh, adopted. But the idea of cycle, I think, is present there as well. Now, it developed the Western semiotic form we recognize today during the, during the Hellenistic period, starting in the 300 BCE. After astrology entered Islamic culture, it was spread to Northern Europe during the Middle Ages. Now, the purpose of the Western Zodiac was, it would seem, to literally map, map, literally map, I'm using that word both, not only metaphorically, but literally, human character and individual destinies against cosmic patterns and forces. Horoscopy was devised as the craft of precisely uh, mapping natal zodiacal signs against the configuration of the heavens at the moment. Um, they're so intricate, they're so complicated that really takes uh, a sophisticated mathematical mind and an astrologer to interpret how all those configurations are connected and the map is made um, to say this is what it means today for you being born under that. So a map has 12 sectors, 
called houses, as we've seen, around the ecliptic, a great circle of the, on the celestial sphere representing the sun's path during the year. Now, the term zodiac referred actually to a bell-shaped region of the sky, and the zodiacal, zodiacal names correspond to the astronomical constellations as they appear to the human eyes in the shape of certain animals in outline form. And these were named, as you may know, according to Greek mythology. Now, in modern astronomy, the same ecliptic coordinate system is still used for tracking solar system objects. The basic methods of Western astrology to this day come from Ptolemy's Tetra Bibulos, written around 140 CE. Ptolemy's goal was to extract predictive information from astral configurations at, a, at specific times of the year using notions that had been established in astronomy, arithmetic, and geometry in his era, which he claimed would pinpoint and explicate precisely the kind of influence celestial bodies have on humans and on the worlds they inhabit. inhabit. The word influence, influence is key here and throughout, and I will come back to it later. Western zodiacs have played various social roles from antiquity to the contemporary era. They're still around. <laughs> and these can be summarized as follows. Can I have the next slide, please? So in antiquity, uh, the zodiac emerged as a sign system interconnecting human life with astrological, uh, cosmological configurations at different times of the year. Zodiacs were seen by the early physicians as part of medical practice. I will come to this believing that the planetary conjunctions had a direct effect on human health. In the medieval period, astrology was considered to be part of learned and scientific culture. Medical practitioners continued to use the zodiac to diagnose the etiology of diseases. Three, in the Renaissance period, astrologers were highly respected as authoritative figures. They were professors even seen as able to predict everything from the weather to the future course of humankind. Many were brought into aristocratic courts to help rulers make their decisions. It was the Enlightenment era where astrology, when astrology was marginalized in Western culture, retaining its functions primarily in cultures that did not undergo a similar movement. Modernity, well, in the 20th century, the Zodiac gained broad popularity through mass media products such as newspaper horoscopes leading to the emergence and spread of what can be called a pop astrology. And the contemporary, well, in the internet age, belief in horoscopy has spread throughout the, the digital universe. There are now even astrology, online astrology influencers with enormous numbers of followers uh, on their social media platforms. Brands now peddle zodiac-themed items and wellness influencers offer self-styled astrology courses for thousands of dollars. The question becomes, is this influx of interest towards astrology having a real impact on the mind state of our generation? Or is it simply another trend? And I said, I will conclude with this consideration in my view. Eh? The Chinese zodiac has played parallel social roles in Chinese society, some of which will be discussed comparatively shortly. Paradoxically, I looked at internet activity and controlled research, such as the Pew Research Company. In the last decade, Western astrology has become more popular in China than anywhere else, it would seem, with millions of followers using both Western and Chinese emoji zodiac signs as part of their signatures and messaging on their social media sites and so on. But it is also true that Chinese people, by and large, like their ancestors, still might consult the horoscope for major life decisions and to try to help someone born under a certain sign fulfill their destiny. Okay, a semiotic interpretation. Uh, for, yeah, that's okay, I can use that. <laughs> First off, I found it somewhat strange that relatively little work has been done in applying semiotics to the zodiac or to astrology more generally. I mentioned a few works which I found interesting in themselves, including a 1990 book, The Semiotics of Fortune Telling, but with a large component on astrology by Edna Affick and Yishai Tobin, 
1997 article, Gray Mouse's Semiotic Square and Greek and Roman Astrology by Graham Douglas, and a 2014 article, Semiotic and Cognitive Peculiarities of Astrological Discourse Organization by Elena Anacheva and Yulia Mamonova. I also found a course given at the Universität Bremen on the semiotics of cosmology with a large astrology component. Five general observations to be made, which are self-evident under any semiotic lens. These are just self-evident, so I'll make them. One, each zodiacal sign is a visual icon in the Western and Chinese um, uh, zodiacs for sure, representing its referent real or imaginary via some pictorial form. In the case of the Western Zodiac, the form can be schematic, outlined as we saw, raising it to a symbolic level. You, you have to know the, the, um, the symbolic uh, history behind it in order to be able to interpret it. So uh, the Aries sign, which stands for the ram, shows an outline of the face and horns of a ram. The Capricorn sign, which stands for the goat, shows the body and head of a goat, but with the tail of a fish, and so on. Two, the Western zodiacal signs are actual astronomical symbols and thus have a common astral referential domain with astronomy. Chinese signs are strictly animal iconic forms referring to the role of animals in nature and in concert with humans as the, um, the origins myth um, emphasized. Three, in both referential domains, human natalities are assigned recurrent meanings, celestial or natural, as the case may be, via transference of meaning. So, for instance, someone born under the sign of Taurus, a constellation which gets its name from its perceived V-shape, symbolizing a bull's head in the sky, will be purportedly bullish by transference. Four. In both zodiacal traditions, the symbolism of the circle cycle is key, forming a kind of meta symbol. And I'll come back to that. In fact, the, tri the signs, as we saw, are positioned in a circular pattern and classified according to three main qualities with symbolic forms, cardinal, outgoing, fixed, stable, and mutable variable. It could have been other forms like the triangle. The triangle is also mystical in antiquity. Um, so, the fact that its circle is connected to cycles in nature and the sky. Five, overall Western zodiacal sign systems can be designated as astral characterial in the sense that it, they interrelate human character with astral configurations. Chinese systems can be char characterized instead as almanacal totemic in the sense that they are based on a worldview draw from envisioning a human bond with nature and other species. There is a lot of overlap, which I can, certainly cannot get into today. Now, one useful approach, semiotic approach, to get into the nature of the zodiacal signs themselves is to adopt and largely adapt generically the Persian triadic analysis of the immediate, the dynamical, and the final interpretive. There are many other ways to do it. I, I, I use this because I found it practical and easily adaptable. Let's consider the dragon sign, which you see before you. Note several distinguishing features, including the claws, emanations from the nose and other parts of the body, which resemble flames. These are quite obvious. And a serpentine body, all signifying features that make the sign recognizable. And in fact, at the immediate interpretive level, the sign is perceptible as a zodiacal form and excludes any other option. That is, it is in Chinese culture and now globally, whereby virtually no one would mistake it for anything other than a zodiacal signifier. Um, that's not true of all the signs, by the way. This may seem trivial, but given the use of dragons in other mythological traditions and today in pop culture, it implies a contextualization of iconic meaning that occurs even at this initial level. At the dynamical level, there are a sub, an array of sub-levels. <laughs> um, one of these can be called form-based refinement. That is, 
any modification to that figure will refine its meaning culturally. From its origin, the dragon has um, been depicted with nine anatomically different forms, such as with a horse's head, standing for power and freedom, with an eagle's head, standing for intelligence and bravery, and so on. Another dynamical sublevel involves socially coded meanings, as you might expect, that might crystallize in the minds of some speaker, of some viewers, depending on their knowledge of the history of the dragon sign. During the Yuan dynasty in the 13th and 14th centuries of the common era, four and five clawed dragons were reserved for the exclusive use by the emperor, um, connecting the number of claws to authority and social power. Improper use of claw number was considered treasonous, punishable by execution of the uh, uh, offender's entire clan. Another dynamical sublevel involves folkloric and mythic meaning, which accrues over time and is absorbed communically via cultural narratives and other expressive vehicles of semiotic transmission, songs, and nursery rhymes, and what have you. The dragon is said to be able to disguise itself as a silkworm or to become a large, as, as so large as to envelop the entire universe. It can form clouds, turn into water. This is the natural osmotic aspect and so on. All traits that reflect the almanacal totemic nature of Chinese zodiac signs more generally. A fourth sublevel is where the sign is interpreted as referring to human character. That's also a refinement level, going back to the refinement uh, system that occurs. To this day, families in China welcome a dragon baby boy, thinking that the boy will have a bright future and su successful career. Um, they also now welcome a dragon baby girl, but there are conditions uh, put on that, which I'll leave to the side because I'm not that familiar with Chinese culture. Now, personality differentiation is not excluded from the character profile, though. When many dragon babies are born in the same year, it means it is assumed and they are expected to compete harder with each other for chances later on. And the final interpretant level is the horoscopic divinatory level. That is the level at which the sign is interpreted in terms of what it implies for those specifically born in a dragon year not only according to the dragon's locus on the zodiac as a character profile. A similar analysis can be applied to the zodiacal signs of any astrological tradition. So let me take the Libra sign. Next um, one as well. I chose this on purpose because this comes from the 15th century and, and contains much more information that would need it today. Um, and it brings out features that would otherwise have to be known historically, and you actually have to be an expert on the zodiac. That's, so that's why I chose it for illustrative purposes. So it's from a manuscript in Augsburg, Germany, circa 1464. At the level of the immediate interpretant, the sign excludes any other possibility than the zodiacal one to it. No one in that era or even today uh, would hardly uh, interpret the scales as weighing devices but as indicative of astral characterial interrelationships. The same holds today for any Libra sign, even in outline symbolic form. At a dynamical level, the placement of the scales within a circle and juxtaposed against the stars is kind of like a, a double level of, our, of articulation. It shows its location in astral terms constituting a kind of interpretive refinement. Of course, today this depiction is not common and would have to be uh, you know, explained, but the fact that the sign can be deciphered in, a, in, a, in this way with modern eyes might indicate unconscious historical uh, knowledge that has accrued over time. At a, another dynamical sublevel, the notion of balance crystallizes via the sign's allusion to the scales of justice, an ancient meta symbol, hence the description of Libran character commonly as someone seeking justice for everyone. And keep in mind that these are all I idealistic portrayals. Obviously, I'm, that's the angle on which I'm coming, uh, prototypical levels. 
things vary from person to person as the actual horoscopes bring about, and I'll get to some of that soon. At a folkloric level, sub-level, the Libra sign is suggestive of balance of light and dark in the skies and in human life because it is during the autumnal equinox when the earth is suspended in the balance of light and dark that the sun crosses into Libra, the halfway point between the summer and winter, winter solstice is forming a kind of seasonal balance. Those born, born under the Libra sign are thus thought to be influenced by this constellation and are thus seen to be well balanced in character. At the final horoscopic divinatory level, the Libra and astral character is mapped against the events that may or may not occur in the world on a daily basis and advice is administered on this basis. Generally, this practice, it's got a technical name, it's called genetheology, purportedly allowing the individual to determine whether or not a particular moment in time is propitious astrologically so as to not act to us act, act you know in a, in a in an untoward way okay astrology and medicine the configuration of the stars and the planets was seen in antiquity as not only related to human character but to human health a major premise of ancient medicine, Western and Chinese, was the correspondence between the signs of the zodiac and the organs or parts of the human body. Hippocrates even wrote that if a physician without a knowledge of astrology has no right to call himself a physician. In effect, the influence, influence again, of astrolo astrological phenomena on bodily functions can be seen to, to be the, a sixth semiotic feature, in addition to the fifth one I mentioned above before, whereby the body symptoms and zodiacal signs have a relationship to each other. In ancient schools and certainly in medieval Renaissance universities, astronomy and astrology were considered to be obligatory subjects of study by students of medicines. That this one was called yatra mathematics. The figure here, the zodiac man, shows. Uh, it's a, a manuscript page from a 15th century Welsh manuscript used as a textbook in medicine. Such manuscripts were common and they were also used by, uh, for quick reference, by physicians, barber surgeons, surgeons, and others involved in healing. We see a naked man, a fa male figure, standing with his legs and arms spread slightly apart, the 12 zodiac signs superimposed on his body from his head. Aries to his feet, Pisces, indicating how each part of the body was ruled physiologically and anatomically by a specific sign of the zodiac. Once the correct sign was diagnosed as the cause of some disease in the relevant part of the body, the proper time for surgery, bloodletting, medication, etc., would could be determined. In line with the astral temporal features associated with the sign, of course. Phys physicians thus diagnosed an, uh, an illness, both medically and in zodiacal uh, terms. There's also a very interesting thing about the theory of conjunctions, which was used to explain the bubonic plague, for example. And the most uh, famous treatise was the Paris Concilium, prepared by 49 medical masters at the University of Paris in October of 1348, at the request of King, King Philip VI, it came to the conclusion that the bubonic plague, the Black Death, was the result of the conjunction of Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars under the sign of Aquarius, which occurred in 1345, following solar and lunar eclipses. Let us hope that this solar <laughs> eclipse is not in a similar conjunction. I'm saying this facetiously, but maybe not so much so. Uh, certainly such views may not, and I'm going to skip a little bit here. I've written a lot more on this. Uh, maybe I'm going to say that maybe some of the resurgence in astrology started during the COVID period where astrologers came forth and, you know, provided horoscopes. And it goes even far back to the hippies and the new age movement where occultism, Eastern philosophy, music uh, were brought into the West as um, a statement of self-spirituality and detraditionalization. Um, and I'm going to briefly mention that astrology and Chinese med medicine have had a similar 
um, a symbiotic relationship. Uh, in the case of China, the idea is that there is a flow of life forces known as qi through the bodily pathways and each of the signs can be a diagnostic tool for detecting where that qi is allocated at certain times. Okay, I'm gonna get to astrology. Um, let me know, Chris, uh, if I'm, I'm okay. I'm gonna take about two minutes for astrology. Is that okay, Chris? <laughs> Anyhow. You're, you're, at, you're at 30 min 32 minutes, Marcel, so. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna take five minutes. <laughs> okay, in matters of love and social relations generally, it is believed in Chinese culture that a dragon personality is most compatible with the rooster, the rat, and the monkey, but least compatible with the ox, the goat, and the dog. Compatible and incompatible signs are grouped into triangles of affinity and antipathy. This would occur, I guess, going back to the six, five, six levels, at a seventh level. I'm adding to those levels as I go along. In Western traditions, the affinity dynam dynamism is, this is triangular, is, is binary. So it's Aries and Leo individuals are believed to, uh, to make an ideal couple while Aries and Cancers are not. There is an implicit theory in all cases of zodiacal attraction and repulsion akin to analogous physical theories. So from its origins, astrology in, was interrelated not only with physical health, but with emotional and social states. The two, body and mind, were perceived as forming a unified monistic structure. In the Middle Ages, <laughs> love was in fact thought to be a disease <laughs> um, and accordingly diagnosed and treated with medical astrology, yatra math mathematics, under the doctrine of the four bodily humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, yellow bile. In a healthy person, all four were thought to be balanced, while illness was caused by disturbances to this balance. Love was seen as such a disturbance, a love sickness, un mal d'amore, which was a synonym for mal d'umore, and thus diagnosed as a disease caused by human uh, imbalance. Among the treatments, purgatives <laughs> and phlebotomy, Bloodletting. Uh, this might seem humorous, but here we go. Another related astrological view of the mind-body dynamism, perhaps more poetic, was that the appearance of certain stars influenced these humors. Um, so consulting an astrologer to seek advice when certain stars were out, and in fact, going under the stars for lovemaking was considered to be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the compatibility of the signs. You know, to this day, star-crossed lovers, love is written in the stars. They are still etched in our idiomatic expressions. And I found these with Google Translator in languages as diverse as Italian and Persian. Persian, not so much a Google Translator. I gave a course once and a student gave a full a report, an essay on Persian love signs and the language that uh, modern day Farsi that still uh, reflects them. Also the word moonstruck um, as a, a synonym for lunatic insanity under the, under the moon, which still is with us uh, and love as a form of in insanity. It's all encapsulated by Shakespeare in his A Midsummer's Night Green, dream when he describes Theseus as the lover, the lunatic, and the poet. Okay, cosmic consciousness. I will be a little bit brief here as well, I'll skip over a few things, because I really want to get to the resurgence part. Love, health, the planets, the moon, the sun, the stars are all component elements of what can be called an astrological cosmic conscious. Unlike a mythological consciousness, as you can see in the early cosmo cosmogonic myths. They seem to me separate. One is based on the a deus ex machina intervention, the other one instead of a universe ex machina intervention. Um, I'll call that a, a cosmic um, consciousness. In fact, it is no surprise to me to find that the origins of astrology and the origins of geometry as both a science under Pythagoras and a, an art, like in sacred 
geometry, a kind of uh, geomantic art, um, occur at the same time. And the idea was that there is a universal ma mathematical, geometric, musical structure at all levels, from the microcosmic, the human being, to the macrocosmic, the universe itself. This worldview was adopted and expanded by Plato, and that's where we get it to this day. In the Republic, he, he posits a rational cosmic order held together by what he called the spindle of necessity, such that the spheres of the fixed stars and the planets are held together by an axis of a spindle. Um, and I'm just to go over a few things quickly in many philosophical traditions, such as even the theogony of the Greek poet Hesiod. The idea is that humans came forward with their sign systems to give order to the universe, a particular order at a particular uh, point in time. It's here that the, the notion of influence is crucial. In the case of the early myths, there's no influence from the gods. There's intervention from the gods in interaction with humans. In the case of astrology, it's an influence from the universe, which is vastly different ontologically. Um, and this idea of influence comes about against in an actual literal way. And as the term influenza denoting a, de a, a, a disease today. And that was first used during the bubonic plague and um, the idea of astrological influences on the on people's body occurred uh, um, in, in a direct way there. And, and therefore we have words like influenza di freddo, meaning influence of the cold from Giovanni Boccaccio and influenza di stelle, the influence of the stars in the same sentence. Incidentally, uh, just to conclude this part, <laughs> this is not Evanesque. To this day, in English, we have expressions such as the universe speaks to us or one's destiny is written in the stars. Okay, let me get to my concluding part. Astrology, more my point of arrival, astrology's resurgence. Let me say that the resurgence applies mainly to Western astrology. In other societies, astrology was never marginalized as it was in the West during the Enlightenment. The resurgence, however, is hardly a retrieval of astrological cosmic consciousness, but rather maybe a Bartzian type recycling of horoscopy into a pop culture version, but there may be more to it. The, hor the horoscopes are in fact created in such a way that anyone can find meaning in them. An effect that psychologists call the, and I'm not making this up, the Barnum, you know, P.T. Barnum effect whereby individuals give high accuracy rate ratings to descriptions of their personality that supposedly are tailored specifically to them, but which are in fact vague and general enough to apply to a wide range of people. Semiotically, one could say that the contemporary pop horoscope is a floating signifier with vague and highly variable and even non-existent meanings to adopt Claude Levi-Strauss's no notion. And as Roland Barthes also observes, some sign systems are so open to interpretation that they constitute a, and I quote, floating chain of signifieds. So it could be said from this chain, a single signified is extracted by the reader of the horoscope, applying it to the personal situation at hand. As American astrologer as quipped, the magical thing about astrology is that you are completely unique. No chart will ever be replicated again, which is really not true in pop or us. Marcel, that's 40 minutes. Okay, can I have five more minutes? Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely, yeah, of course. Okay. You know, you cannot but be cynical in witnessing a boom in pop astrology industry. Horoscope apps like CoStar, Sanctuary, and Nebula are at the vanguard of this the uh, explosion, and I'm going to skip a little bit here. I made notes on 100 daily horoscopes published online over a th uh, three-week period, and I'm going to show you one of them. But here's the general things that I found. First of all, I found that the interlocution with the reader was typically positive, although a few bits of negative information were inserted. Uh, so, you know, you would get advice such as, well, you can get through these problems. 
you are you with your quality oh just keep a steady path and similar locutions virtually all horoscopes use hypothetical clauses such as if you are having problems at work or or when things seem to go wrong and similar expressions a major implicit strategy was to tap into current moods and state of affairs i found horoscopes that were more negative in content during moments of economic social and political crises, but more positive when the social picture was encouraging. Okay, look at this Libra horoscope, taken at random. I, I took this two weeks ago. Uh, let's read it. This is a day to think about your private life, Libra. If you're thinking why I've chosen Libra throughout, guess why? <laughs> I wanted to see if it, had, if it really did apply. Anyhow, expect to be particularly sensitive to all kinds of demands on those close to you. You have the power to create greater harmony at home, specifically um, in your relationship. Take stock of everyone's desires and consider any limitations of fulfilling them. Even if the answers are found today, it will be useful to simply ask the questions. Okay, note a few things. I'll be quick. Note the direct address, as if the astrologer was talking to me. Your private life, close to you. You have the power. Your relationship. Now, the statement, think about your private life. Huh. This clearly taps into uh, the Barnum effect and maybe even an egocentric mood that has spread broadly through it. The implication is uh, private life takes precedence over everything else. And of course, we all have a private life, so the statement will resonate in an ersatz realistic manner to any. Now, the same can be seen, the applied illusion with a statement that says create greater harmony by taking stock of everyone's desires. It also is tapping in to the uh, character profile of the Libra as someone who tries to restore balance. This is very, that's in the subtext. That is, that is really very, very clever, actually. Then I looked at statistics and I found that in fact, today, friendship is considered more important than anything else. Personal feelings are more important than anything else. So most of the horoscopes are based on highlighting the feelings of the person. And note finally in that, that <laughs> this I love, even if the answers aren't found today, it will be useful to simply ask the questions. What the heck does that mean? I, this does not need any commentary, okay? In a relevant 1980 book titled, titled Holistic Astrology, Astrologer Neil Tao, PYL, suggested that the functions of contemporary astrology were hardly based on the ancient sense of cosmic consciousness, as I have called, called it, but rather related to psychological need theory, which posits that needs and everyday stress act together to create an eternal state of this equilibrium where people feel impelled to engage. And, that, and it leads to, you know, finding ways of fulfilling your own destiny by fulfilling your needs. So I, I interviewed a someone who teaches astrology as part of a course in philosophy in Europe and said it might be modern day therapy and doesn't cost very much. That was important. Okay, let me conclude. Concluding, Chris, one minute. What to conclude? Well, maybe the global popularity of the dragon sign as a harbinger of good things might provide a plausible reason for the resurgence of astrology today, namely as an antidote to a Durk Durk Durkheimian anomie, which occurs in peri uh, during periods of rapid social change and cultural upheaval. Maybe, maybe I'm stretching it. At the very least, a horoscope provides a framework for combating personal uh, stress and needs because it generalizes them and, and by talking about them, much like therapy, they seem to evanesce in some ways. Of course, the, the case of the dragon is a little different because there is a strong cultural component which serves a symbolic as a symbolic vehicle for Asian communities to showcase and preserve their cultural identities in a changing world. In effect, whatever the truth, as in the past, astrologies continues to convey, even in a spurious way, the sense that happenstance occurrences, such as time and day of birth, are not disconnected ones, but have intrinsic meaning. 
unlike some of the Coen Brothers movies where everything is truly random and there is no intrinsic meaning. These do provide it. And it's outside of religion and other kinds of, how can I say, spiritualistic um, ideas. In all cases, it is the sense of intrinsic meaning, which seems to have great resonance within a system of meaning, not outside. It's not dispersive. It's not ambiguous. The, the Horus book is a Libyus, but not how we, we get the meaning from it. Uh, it will disappear. I have no doubt about it as any other trend, not astrology, pop horoscopy. Um, Susan Greenfield, a neuroscientist says, today we suffer from source amnesia. What does this mean? Well, it's not so much the loss of memory as the loss of how and when a memory was created. One may remember a fact, but now how and when we learned it. These recollections are lost in the, the order or chronology and pop horoscopy may eventually become a victim of source amnesia created by technology. This does not, I know, address the question of why we continue even to talk about astrology. My guess is that it has left archetypal residues that are in our narratives, that are in, that is in our language, that is in all those historical vehicles, semiotic vehicles that are brought forward and become unconscious. Not a kind of Jungian unconscious, but a semiotic unconscious. So perhaps let's me quote a skeptic of why, even to this day, we uh, continue to discuss astrology. The observation by the writer Arthur C. Clarke is worth revisiting here in this sense, by way of conclusion, since it alludes to it facetiously. Sorry, facetiously. Here's what he wrote. I do not believe in astrology, but then I'm a Sagittarius and we are skeptical. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. And uh, what an amazing survey of uh, a very rich semiotic topic. Uh, search for meaning is, I know, something that you've dedicated your life to in various fields from emojis through love cigarettes and high heels all the great books you've written and this is just another area that you've really helped uh, give an incredibly um, galvanizing and interesting and erudite uh, discussion to why am I surprised Marcel this is what you do um, you'll forgive me as a fussy Virgo. I'm I'm a, I'm a stickler for time, um, but um, my horoscope my horoscope today um, says that um, overindulgence in food and drink for the last few days could be causing me to feel a little bit out of sorts. I did actually indulge. I'm in Mexico, guys, so good food out out here. Um, and it says never be afraid of who you are or what you want. And then it follows that with a psychic reading can reveal the best way to obtain your goals. And then for a small fee, I'm able to get that psychic reading. So <laughs> as uh, that's, uh, I guess, part of this world, contemporary world. So I'm not going to talk now. My job is to uh, direct traffic in terms of conversation. So I'm going to look at who's off mute. That may just, just be totally, um, totally coincidental, but I'm going to pick on somebody. And um, I will then um, go into um, if you can um, make reserve, you know, if you can confine your com your question to sort of two, three minutes, ideally, because there's quite a few of us on the call. So I'm going to go down to um, Professor Susan Petrilli, if that's all right, because I can see her off mute. If you're OK to ask a question uh, or make a comment. Well, uh, hello, all. Can I just introduce um, Professor Susan Petrilli? So as a senior semiotician for the University of Bari, who's published on Purse, Lady Welby, Semiotics of Translation, um, also her book um, with uh, Gusta Ponzio, Semiotics Unbounded, is uh, on my bookshelf. But yeah, go ahead, uh, Susan. Well, um, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm off mute, she said. I didn't know. <laughs> so this is by pure chance. Um, I'm, uh, well, uh, first of all, obviously I'm surprised, Carlo Marcello. I didn't know about these interests in your research it's wonderful uh, I'm not uh, there's not um, uh, much I can say I'm not an expert obviously of this kind of sign but listening to you 
uh, I, I don't find it surprising at all, uh, you know, that that we extend our gaze, obviously, uh, in the search of meaning uh, to larger dimensions. Um, that's an expression I use from Victoria Welby. Uh, larger dimensions. I mean, this is uh, it, it's just so typical of humanity. Um, uh, in our search for meaning, uh, also uh, listening to you name all these different sciences, um, astrology, um, associated to mathematics and all the sciences that you uh, mention, astronomy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this goes so much, that's so healthy. It's such a healthy way of uh, pushing forward and looking at life and looking at the universe, um, insisting on this uh, condition of interconnectedness and dialogism, I would say, as a motive for life, as a motive for research, as a motive for reflection also in uh, these um, uh, what would seem to be unscientific dimensions, but which are connected. Um, I won't go on about that, but what I would, uh, I was I found your uh, comment at the end very interesting. You know how you were saying that, um, how do we explain this resurgence of interest in uh, the uh, in astrology and the uh, how do you say it in English uh, zodiac uh, the zodiac signs and things like that, um, and you commented that it is a focus on more personal the the, the more private personal spheres of life, and uh, to that I would comment yes, and that's interesting um, because this is a society that is largely uh, oriented in. Um, in a very egocentric, I would say, direction. You know, you can see another metaphor is the use of selfies, for example. Uh, this um, tendency, a dominant tendency to look at oneself inside, uh, which tells me also of a lack of interest in uh, today in the social and in politics. Um, and it would be more, it would be interesting to see a resurgence in that way. What is the connection between in all this interest and focus on the personal life, the private life, um, as though it's not connected to the public life. Uh, the connection, <laughs> as uh, two and a half minutes teaches us, is yeah. absolutely vital. Um, and we we need to be looking also and using this to reflect about our engagement in the social, in politics, especially in front of what's happening in the world today. I'll stop Susan, there. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Actually, the word egocentric and the connection to the larger communal consciousness. I miss, I skipped that whole part. I, as I yeah. said, I hope yeah. to write this up in a, in a yeah. book. Uh, yeah. Right on. Uh, there is no evidence in antiquity, medieval or Renaissance periods. I looked at Boccaccio in the, especially the Decameron and other treatises that there was interest in the individual as individual having a special uh but that the individual's birth was special in terms of the universe, that it was part of it. This seems to me, it's, it's gone inward looking. Let the universe come to me and not me connect with the universe. I also looked at um, uh, a, a lot of online, uh, online um, texts and things uh, dealing with politics uh, and sub subjectivity, um, commonalities of conflicts and so on. Once that happens, people tend not to use zodiacal signs. The same uh, person who used on X a zodiac, he says, oh, this person is a Libra and stay or, or is a Scorpio, stay away. When that same person started talking about the problems in, say, Gaza today, there was no more mentions of astrology. It came right down to the human context. So the difference seems to me that there is no more cosmic consciousness as such. But using the cosmos to explain the present times in my own way, that is vastly different than through an astrologer, um, a real astrologer, not an, I don't know what to call them, pop <laughs> astrologers who offer the services for money and so on. Very huge topic, very important. Um, yesterday in talking to Paul during my um, um, practice session, he mentioned better to believe in astrology and some of the other horrible things that are going on today. 
How, how spot on. Absolutely spot on. It may have, you know, it may be spurious. It may have nothing. But is it going to really harm anyone? Unlike other things? Yes. Very good comment. Uh, Ma Marcel, um, what we're going to do, I think, is we're going to get all the questions in. And um, then if you would um, take notes and then respond at the end. Um, okay. So thank you very much. All right. So... Uh, thank you, Susan, for that contribution. Um, I see Roman is off mute as well, so I'm going to I'm going to pick on Roman now. I'm a total bully here. Um, so Roman Esqueda, um is teaching design and, and marketing and semiotics in Mexico. Uh, he's director of Synapsen, um, the author of a number of books that I've read in Spanish. I would add, and he was our keynote speaker at Semiafest in in 2022 as well. So go ahead, Roman. Have uh, you put your comments? And if Marcel, if you wouldn't mind just taking little notes and we'll come to you at the end to respond. Go okay. ahead, uh, Roman. Thank you, Chris. Hi. Hello, everyone. Marcel, this was a fascinating talk. Very, very interesting. As, as a matter of fact, I am working on a very similar subject with my new book. And this is this has to do with all many of the things that you've mentioned. And uh, I would like to be as um specific as possible because many ideas come to my mind but one of the first ideas that you mentioned was the difference between astrology the astrological tradition and pop astrology because yes. most of the time when we hear about uh, astrology today we think about pop astrology but astrology was something else in in the past and it was very important and it was at least in greece it was in the context of divination a general thing they call divination. And some of the writers that have analyzed divination in Greek uh, uh, times speak about, for example, Plato and Aristotle taking divination seriously. Mm -hmm. It was not something pop. <laughs> it was something serious. And it had to do with what you mentioned. It was related to science, to metaphysics, to medicine, and to architecture. So yep. what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to analyze this tradition because it can be very helpful for today's semiotics because it gives us another view of semiotics it's completely different so you spoke about the uh, the semiotic unconscious and some of the authors i, I have been working with uh, i try to to blend semiotics with cognitive science and neuroscience and some neuroscientists have proven that our brain is uh, designed by evolution as and guessing system. Mm -hmm. It's always uh, facing uncertainty, so it has to guess permanently. And I think that the, the, one of the reasons why people are still engaged with pop astrology today is because the brain is made to do that. They we all want to know what's going to happen next. <laughs> you know? So I think it's very, very fascinating. And one of the other things that I, I would like you to comment about is, for example, Hippocrates and the tradition of, of uh, early medicine as semiotic systems, as complex semiotic systems. So mm -hmm. when, when we read Hippocrates, he speaks about, you cannot just go and see the, the, your patient as a single unity. And this has, I, I think, something to do with what Susan just said. They were not entities. They were not subjects in the way we, we think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was fascinated by the way uh, the semiotic system of Hippocrates was, you know, like, for example, he speaks about, I need to know about the positions of the stars when the, pe the people, the, the person was born. I need to know what she eats. I need to do what, uh, know what she makes every day. So it was a very complex system of science, not a text in, the, in, our, in our actual way, but an open, an open experience. So I think to understand uh, the way two and a half minutes, up, Roman. Yes, uh, it's a complex system, which is an abductive system, which mm -hmm. doesn't look for an exact meaning. As you said in the, the last example, uh, today's pop astrology is this means that, and that's it. <laughs> and it wasn't like that. So I would like you to comment on that. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind just making a note of that, um, and then we'll come back at the end. So. Um, I'd like to maybe, um, if that's all right, maybe I could ask um, Monica to to go next. So Monica is a professor emeritus from North Carolina University, currently residing in Brazil, I believe in Rio, 
Uh, Monica, you've got um, up to three minutes to make a comment or question for Marcel. Okay. Thanks for your talk. It was really fascinating and especially, you know, detailed. But on, on the other side, it's a very large and complex field. So I'm, my question goes back to the dragon. Okay, so the, there's a lot of narrative about dragons in the fantasy world. You have in Tolkien, you have in Rowling's uh, Harry Potter. And then you have less in the, um, how do you say, technological world of science fiction. Nowadays, I have been observing a lot of these pro, uh, programs on the History Channel, and uh, they show several Asian and other Oriental countries where you have the dragon represented on sculptures and paintings. And uh, the, the way they interpret is, is that uh, these uh, people, they see always an entity coming from heaven mm -hmm. on a dragon, and you know, enveloped in smoke and all the, this fire, and these scientists that who work with the alien world and UFO, they think that uh, the dragon is a symbol of really, you know, uh, something uh, that comes from the other world. You know, a, a device that comes from the other world. So my question is: Have you been researching uh, on this part? of the dragon or what do you think about this? Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you very much, Monica, for that contribution. That's uh, brilliant. So it's such a rich um, variety of questions and comments that Marcel I'm sure will respond to at the end. So if I could go next to uh, Gregory uh, Pachelidis, uh, who's a, a semiotician from uh, the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Um, Gregory, so you have up to three minutes to pose a question or make a comment on Marcel's talk. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, someone has picked up, pick up, picks up the uh, the um, a topic that, uh, in my mind, it was uh, famously dealt with by Adorno more than half a century ago in the early fifties, starts down to to Earth. And uh, I think the whole project fits perfectly with uh, uh, Marcel's sustained investigation of, pop of the popular culture and its different uh, forms and transformations. Uh, one of the major points that Adorno has made in that uh, 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 essay from, uh, from the 50s is the anachronistic element of the uh, of astrology and its place in in in, in modern culture, but uh, he his emphasis at the same time is on the institutionalization and socialization of the occult, which I think there is some sort of a contradiction there. I mean, the his description of institutionalization of the occult points rather to a kind of banalization of the occult rather than the. Uh, mm -hmm somehow uh, transformation of the supernatural beliefs and so forth. It's, uh, uh, so it's, I think, best to be described as a banalization rather than an anachronistic element. Although I want to keep this anachronistic element for another point I want to raise, uh, go even further back <laughs> uh, to the work of uh, Ernst Bloch in the 30s uh, with the uh, uh, heritage, the cultural heritage. Uh, mm -hmm. His whole project is infused by this idea that our, our cultural heritage is a, a chimera, is a chimeric. In other words, it combines heterogeneous elements from different time periods and traditions. And uh, well, that's that's what makes it so interesting and so inspiring and so um, productive in many respects. And uh, I think perhaps uh, his characterization of of, uh, of this heterogeneity of our cultural heritage continues to be relevant today. Uh, in other words, the chimeric uh, uh, element. And I will round off, round off my my short intervention with this dragon figure, which is so fascinating. Now I 
I don't know, Marcel, if I'm not mistaken, but I, half the figure of the of the dragon, I see the four cosmological elements: earth, fire, air, and water combined. Yes. Yep. But whereas in the East, as you correctly pointed out, it's still uh, celebrated as a very important uh, uh, figure uh, symbol. In the West, we have a long tradition of the hero as a dragon slayer. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether there is some sort of an interesting uh, starting point to uh, 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 articulate some sort of, uh, of an approach there. And I will complete my, my intervention with this pointing out that the connection with the great chain of being, this idea of uh, pan-symbolism and the order of the, of the uh, uh, universe, which I think the Renaissance was the first period where those two orders were combined, in other words, the zodiac order as uh, an instance of symbolism and the idea of the chain of being. And in that in this sense, we had uh, uh, the articulation of an ancient idea with uh, a more uh, relatively modern idea back then. I think in many respects, our contemporary fascination and continual uh, engagement with astrology is very much part of our Renaissance heritage then. Mm. To go back to to block. <laughs> Thank, Ooh, you I agree. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Gr Grigoris. Um, so uh, maybe I'll come now to um, to uh, Rukmini Bayanaya. Um, sorry if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Um, linguist and poet who researches and teaches both in Delhi and London at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi, and I think it's Queen Mary. Um, Westfield in London and um, so you have up to three minutes to comments um, or questions for Marcel. Well in the interest of the confessional you know you pointed out that you were a, a, a Virgo and I am both a dragon and a Libra the two signs that the speaker spent most time uh, to have a personal investment in this or I would I'm not an atheist. I have several questions, but I'll try to keep within the three minutes. The first, and I'll pull on certain threads. So first is this notion of compatibility. So you said every human has a kind of uh, locus, a special locus in the universe, depending on where the stars are and where uh, the person happens to be at the time of their birth. Uh, do they also have a compatibility locus in the sense that all these systems go on to say, oh, these numbers are more compatible, these signs are more compatible with your signs, and so on. So compatibility would tie in with a kind of social um, reach, the social reach of astrology. Where, uh, and I think that so a compatibility locus would be something that came out of this. Secondly, I wanted to talk about culture. Oh, India is very obsessed with um, uh, astrological systems, but has no animal systems. I wanted to ask you whether the association of uh, dragons or all the signs of the Chinese zodiac with elements like wood, fire, metal, and so on, and with natural kinds, and also with numbers, has to your mind a particular uh, uh, something to say to us about how we link the scientific and the uh, astrological. Thirdly, the question about cosmology and uh, the cosmic, cosmic. This is, I don't want to name drop, but this is a question I did discuss with a very famous British physicist, who, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, who asked me the difference between cosmology and the cosmic, between astrology and the um, uh, astronomical uh, uh, or astronomy. And what I wanted to... Yes. Two and a half minutes. Yes, so I'll just wind up. What I wanted to point out is this seems to me a lot like Kant, who said, you know, there's the starry heavens above and the moral law within me, and I, these both seem absolutely uh, visible to me, and I want to, uh, I, I think that 
one should be, Kant said in his critique of for pure reason, uh, one should see this and be able to contact, um, you know, be able to explain it. And as a linguist, one of the things that I would look at with Kant saying, you should be able to see these connections. They are not absurd, but they are part of our um, beyond the rational being. And philologically, the word dragon is connected to the root which is in drishti, to see. So my question is, what does the contemporary person see in today's systems? And I was struck by the fact that you did not mention the word future all that much when talking about, uh, about uh, you know, the contemporary. But a lot of people see the future as one a preeminent a sort of locus of change, and therefore, you know, uh, they rely on these fun systems of individuation. So okay, Marcel, th thank you very much, uh, Rukmini. We've got a lot to to get get into there, your teeth into there, Marcel. Um, so I'm going to go to Piotr, then Hongbing, then um, Evripedis, and then Panchanan. I haven't forgotten you. Just going one by one. So. Um, Piotr Sadowski teaches film and creative media at Dublin Business School. Uh, Piotr, you have up to three minutes to make comments and questions on Marcel's talk. I'll, I'll keep, uh, keep it uh, short, Chris. Thanks very much. And thank you, Marcel, for a delightful, uh, I was, it's, it's, it was informative, but also very entertaining uh, lecture, uh, bringing back to us this important uh, chapter, a tradition of not just Western culture, uh, and uh, comparing it with, with Chinese, but it's, it seems to be a universal. Um, I'm sure ethnographers, anthropologists can confirm that people everywhere and at all times in history have been interested in the sky, in the things above them, in the regularities of the, 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 the heavenly movements, uh, the, the main uh, mm -hmm. heavenly bodies, uh, the star and the moon and the planets and uh, the constellations, various combinations, and they were, uh, it, but that's part of the of the the, the explorator in need, being curious about our immediate uh, environment. In this case, non-human, uh, even non-living uh, uh, environment, and at the same time, sort of um, um, homocentrically applying it to ourselves and. Uh, uh, speculating about the the, the significance, um, the impact all that environment, uh, in this case a remote environment above us, has. Um, so it's to to me uh, the, the 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 interest in the sky and uh, um, how it applies to us when we cast horoscopes, where when we uh, find a unique individual place in the system of, of uh, the zodiacal uh, signs boils down to uh, our cognitive needs, in this case to the te uh, to the teleological need. Yeah. That com cognitive compulsion of looking for causes and purposes and things, the goals mm -hmm. and the associated meaning. Um, you quoted a, a philosopher um, uh, you know who uh, lectures on the history of astrology, and and then he says that I don't really believe this. It's fact. It, it's factually probably wrong, but it is therapeutic, and mm -hmm. that's probably what uh, uh, what's important in it. It's it's a form of art. Um, uh, scientists, astrophysicists, biologists dismiss alchemy and astrology as non scientific, non factual. Uh, it's one of those uh, um, unfalsifiable systems of thought. Um, that uh, uh, Karl Popper um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, reserved for non-scientific systems. Well, That's we need two and a half minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it, it's it's <laughs> okay. I'll I'll be finishing. Otherwise, uh, Chris, you, you're right. I'll, I'll I'll be rambling. But thank you, Marcel. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, both uh, instructive and entertaining because there is uh, something comforting. It's what Hesiod uh, um, uh, 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 explained uh, over 2,000 years ago, that it's it's a way of imposing order into the world, and we still need it. Science do doesn't always do that. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Piotr. Okay, so we're going to move to Hongbing Yu now, um, who is Professor of Semiotics and Culture at, Tokyo, at Toronto Metropolitan University. So Hongbing, you have up to three minutes for comments and questions to Marcel. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Marcel, um, as always, for this wonderful, informative, and awesome, entertaining uh, talk. And you have written so many books and added to so many books on the pop culture and and semiotics in general. And uh, you mentioned, it's interesting that you mentioned, um, you're talking about this a topic that uh, would make a lot of people in China, my country fellows, feel that they, they have a lot to resonate with you. Um, it's, it's interesting because in China, you probably, you don't know this, but uh, uh, in China, you're considered one of the giants in cultural semiotics at least in North America, and uh, um, I'll be very happy to share with you, share your insights with uh, some, of my, some of my students and the colleagues in China. Uh, anyways, uh, back to my point of uh, built on what you have uh, said, and also what the uh, other uh, panelists have said, especially what Piotr has said. Um, this is really fascinating. Um, what I can say, what I have been inspired uh, by your, by your talk and also your books to say is that uh, semiotics uh, should probably be better you know, uh, regarded as both a science and art of meaning making. Piotr said, and Piotr just said that the science alone cannot provide an ever, you know, explanation for everything. Uh, that's true. But semiotics is so, it's, it's, a, it's in a special vantage point because um, if it is considered the, both the science and art of meaning making, then it points to the fact that every human being, uh, including the semioticians, are semiotic beings or cultural beings uh, who try to construct a comprehensive perspective on all media with respect to their capacities for structure and representation. Um, if we take the zodiac signs and as a case in point, uh, you will see that um, uh, people would find it easy to see that um, all the semiotic systems, and the signs, or semiotic models that, and as a species, we have been capable of constructing, they help us create um, immediate reality, realities we go through, probably as a part of I, our identities, collective or individual. Two and a half and minutes. This, something. Yeah, thank you, Chris. But at the same time, these identities semiotic, you know, by nature, probably could be potentially be shackles that constrain our uh, innate uh, need for some kind of freedom. So um, to me, we're invariably looking at a, a kind of paradox. Semiotic reality is created for us for you know, to be part of our identities, but this is semiotic reality that can also you know, constrain um, the humanity. Sometimes, so I was wondering, um, you know, by using this example of the zodiac sign of dragon, and and other relevant uh, examples, how how can we, you know, go beyond the signs in order to achieve a higher level of uh, or sense of freedom, not simply just being indulged or immersed in the semiotic systems. Thank you very much, Hong Bing, for that contribution. And Marcel, I hope you're taking assiduous notes here of all the things you have to come back on. <laughs> thought this would be a, <laughs> you thought this would be a relaxing Sunday afternoon. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to go to Evropedis Antidis now, um, who is Professor of Department at the Department of Graphic Design and Communication and the Technological University of Cyprus. I've been a long, I've been admire, been a long admirer of the department, one of the best websites, I think, of any semiotics department, obviously very visually literate. So, um, Evropedis, you have uh, up to three minutes to make comments and questions for Marcel. Yes, uh, thank you, Marcel, for a fascinating and very impressive information you get, you shared with us this afternoon. Um, coming from a, a visual perspective, I am very interested to find out about uh, the visualization of the horoscope science and how this are actually taking into become iconic forms. Um, you mentioned how uh, some of these patterns are actually 
embedded in the stars, but also some of them are uh, metaphorically or symbolically um, designed and interpreted in the in, in a dynamic interpretation, like you, you explained it from the perspective of the, of the Persian perspective. So maybe you can uh, provide us uh, with some more information about the visual visualization of the horoscope signs. But also, I was uh, very fascinated to see uh, the, the the various aspects of the dragon icon, and maybe you, you could let us know if there are any uh, how does uh, um, visual communication and particularly maybe graphic design uh, use dragons in their narratives um, or in the commercial part of advertising? Are there any specific signifiers that are prevailing from the characteristics of the dragon, for example, the dragon oil logo, or generally in terms of uh, graphic and visual communication. And of course, film and literature is another huge area that dragons uh, uh, present themselves as signs. However, graphic and visual communication, I think, is also a fascinating area that uh, worth exploring the dragon in the horoscopes. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much, Arapidus, for that contribution um, and keeping it short as well. So finally, and last but not least, we have um, we have uh, Pachanan Mohanty, um, and who's Professor of Linguistics at Lalanda University. So Pachanan, Pat, uh, do come off mute and um, you have up to three minutes to comment for comments and questions to Marcel. Yeah, thank you. Um... It's a very fascinating talk because, um, you know, I thought uh, um, astrology is not taken very seriously in the West. So, you know, uh, I was delighted that, you know, in India, yes, uh, there is a um, division. Most people, the so-called, uh, you know, city dwellers, urban, urbanized people, they are not very strong believers in astrology. But, you know, when we talk about the rural areas, they are believers in astrology. And almost every village has a couple of astrologers. Whenever a child is born, you know, the astrologer comes, takes the time and prepares the horoscope for, for, for the, uh, you know, um, uh, child. So this is what happens. And as uh, um, Rukmini Bhaiya Nair was saying, you know, uh, here uh, compatibility is very, very important. Uh, in, uh, at least in India, uh, the, the horoscope is not a private document. It's a kind of semi-private document. And the horoscope is read before everybody when a child is born and the astrologer comes with the horoscope and tells them that, yeah, this is the future and this is what the child might become and these are the possibilities and what are the uh, what the problems are also mentioned, you know, in everything. One more thing I should inform you, Marcel, we have something, I don't know probably whether it is there in other states or not. The state I come from, I come from Odisha and there is something called Ayurja. Ayu is uh, lifespan. And ja is whatever, you know, is uh, takes birth kind of thing. Ayurja, it's a detailed kind of thing. My brother, you know, used to, who is no more, has a detailed, some 30, 40 page kind of description of everything. When this horoscope is written on palm leaf normally, palm leaves, but, you know, Ayurja is written on paper and it's a detailed kind of one. Um, what, uh, you know, is important is that the whenever a, a, an astrologer says that these are the problems uh, this person is going to have at a particular age, etc., etc., that can be repaired also. This is something which is very important in the Indian tradition. If there is a problem, you do certain things and it can be avoided. So that is also there in the Indian tradition. Number one. Then another thing which goes hand in hand with astrology is palm mystery. Yeah. Look at the palm, the, the 
uh, you know, whatever those uh, 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 three minutes, Pachanan. Yeah, yes. Uh, whatever you have on the palm, you know, those um, lines, they are also interpreted along with astro, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 whatever is mentioned in the horoscope. So it's a kind of very, uh, if one looks at the, um, um, whatever is mentioned in the horoscope, then whatever is there on the palm, palm mystery, and you know other things, then it becomes um, really much better. That's what people do in the Indian tradition. Because I come from a village, and I know this is something which normally happens. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pachanan, and thank you to all the contributions. Um, so, Marcel, um, this is going to sound rather unfair, but I'm going to ask you if you could try to answer all the questions in 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, that's one and a half minutes um, per, per question, but that may be totally unrealistic. Paul has said that you should, you know, make sure you answer all the questions, but uh, do your best. I, I will try my best. First of all, I, I'm really impressed by the uh, response. Um, I had mentioned at the beginning that there's a, it's a huge topic. I'm delighted to see that it has had that kind of resonance, that it is a huge topic. I don't know which order I'm going to go in here. I'm going to start maybe with vagueness, the idea of vagueness and ambiguity. Uh, the, um, the first uh, intervention, now I forget who it was. But the idea that a, uh, a statement in a horoscope, a measurement, um, a map uh, is not vague in astrological terms. It may be vague in the human interpretive realm. So it does go back and forth. The pop a horoscopy today is based on vagueness. But as in the as in the ancient world, it provides that assurance that I am part of the world and uh, therefore in, 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 in a universe in which I can immerse myself and other people will understand me. In many of the messages I saw on X, people say, oh, don't listen to that person. He's a Scorpio. Or, yeah, no, you should listen to that person. He's a dog in, in Chinese and so on and so forth. So the vagueness is part of the, how can I call it? One of the protocols, one of the Gricean, <laughs> Paul Grice's uh, maxims of how we make communication. We assume that there is truth in it, extract it and use it in the context. Very hard to answer these questions, really, really hard. And and I'm going to the idea of, to um, Gregory's mention of Adorno. I actually had written about Adorno in my presentation, and I skipped it. Um, and the whole idea of commodification of um, of ancient ideas coming forth, which is one of the themes in Roland Barthes as well. I also looked at Marcuse, who had a more favorable view um, of this because Marcuse had a more favorable view of the hippies and the counterculture movement and jazz and everything that was coming back as a, a kind of counterculture to the mainstream. But the idea of the chain of being, being that you mentioned and, and the chimeric nature of the world is something that I had alluded to, but I'm gonna make that more explicit as I go on because it does. Uh, it does connect with Bloch and, and, and the ancient world and Pythagoras, of course. Many, three or four asked me to elaborate on the dragon. <laughs> what can I say? The dragon has so many meanings, so many traditions. It is also a, a heraldic emblem. Um, it it uh, brings in, uh, it's the, a symbol of chaos on one part. A sim, uh, it must be slayed. The dragon must be slayed. The, 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 the traditions, um, our religious traditions of slaying dragons. Um, we still have it as our metaphorical language. Um, um, if uh, war is fought between a smaller power and a, a smaller society and a larger one will say, well, that society has to slay the dragon. That's everywhere. One word I like to use in this, I, I don't want to introduce it now, but I will, not a metaphor, but a metaform, a kind of form that's everywhere that finds expression in language, in symbols, a kind of network of meanings that are tied around a core. Um, it is symbolic, it is mythical. Um, I did see it in some advertising uh, <laughs> as, a, as not as a logo, but as a cartoon and one I can't remember where. 
Um, I got lots of notes I've got in, in other areas, but I'm going to try to bring all of these in. You know what I didn't notice? Well, maybe someone can help me eventually. In film, in movies, the theme of astrology occurs sporadically, more less so than, uh, you know, fortune telling, less so than now today's UFOs and people coming from the skies and things of that nature. I'm not sure why that is. I have to look into that a little bit for, further. Um, compatibility. Yes. <clears throat> It is very likely that even in the ancient world, if you went to an astrologer, that astrologer was probably also a numerologist and also probably a chiromante, a chiromantic uh, you know, type of one who projected um, ideas into the future. Um, I didn't mention the future per se because divination and the one who mentioned divination, I have a whole section. It is so crucial to understand divination. I actually treated this in uh, an, another book I did for Paul on warning signs um, where divination of catastrophes coming forth, so especially in Greek culture, but in other cultures as well, was crucial to trying to understand the folk myths of certain areas. They were based, based on divination, and on, um, but divination itself <laughs> based on recurrence, uh, cyclic patterns, and, and, and things of that nature. And this is where geometry, mathematics, uh, arithmetic, mathematics came later, but geometry, arithmetic, astrology, astronomy, medicine, and on and on and on formed a kind of common consciousness, a common goal. The separation of these disciplines, some of, some of it understandable, separating astrology from astronomy makes sense, alchemy from chemistry makes, makes sense, but if they were still together into a holistic view, there would be probably more metaphysical discussion. <laughs> I'm not sure how journals of science would say, we won't want any metaphysical discussion. Just give us the results of your experiment. I still think that a little bit of metaphysical discussion here and there, not to spruce up the science, but to give it the broader, larger context in which it is. Mom, mommy, I don't know where to go from here. There are so many other things. Kant, yes, of course, there's a Kantian element. There's also a Jungian element here that I didn't go into deeply. Jung was a firm believer of, um, of astrology. And in his actual clinical practices, he wanted to know what the signs were of the person. And on the basis of that, entered into a dialogue into a dialogue with that um, um, patient or uh, person. And um, not in the same way that, for example, the ancient physicians or medieval physicians did um, in an etiological way, I'm gonna detect, but trying to understand, make that person understand that many of the things are maybe beyond the person's uh, ego, but within the person's subconscious, and where they ruminate as symbols and, and expressions and they come out in perhaps in dreams and in other forms. I don't know what to do, Chris, from here. There's I got I've got notes galore, but uh maybe I should just simply wrap it up and say this has been for me um an instructive um discussion. Um, it, it, uh, it made me realize that uh, when I first started this, I said, eh, it's interesting in itself. It's much more than interesting. Some have said that maybe it may bring to a revival of uh, semiotics as a, as a broader discipline um, that doesn't have to compete with cognitive science or neuroscience. It doesn't have to, but can approach things in its own ways, which are humanistic in one side, but also mathematical. They can look at things as precisely as anyone else, but leave space for interpretation, which is crucial in meaning making. Anyhow, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Marcel. I do have one further question for you, and I would encourage panelists, many of whom probably know Marcel, um, to message email. him um, individually. Email. If email, email him, yes. Email. Um, if yeah, email. Um, he hasn't answered your question specifically, but I'm sure you'll appreciate there's a lot for anyone to answer there. But it just shows what a fascinating topic. One final question. We have a question online from uh, Amon P. Petkoff. Who oh, yes. writes, Hi, Dr. Danese. This is O.W. Petkoff from Texas, the USA. In your introduction, you mentioned Gen Z and its interest in zodiac signs. 
open brackets, I'm paraphrasing, close brackets. Given your landmark work in emoji studies and our recent co-authored work in this role in higher education, can you draw any parallels between Gen Z's interest in emoji and zodiac signs? It's a thought that OW has just put into my mind. <laughs> I had put, you know, when you finish something, you put it. I did notice emoji, uh, zodiac signs throughout the universe of social media. They're there everywhere. If they're going to use any, I guess it's also easier just to click it on or to touch it on rather than look for some, uh, you know, more traditional symbol of the, uh, uh, of the zodiac sign. So it may form a kind of... Uh, complementary discourse modality to everything else that's going on in the text message or anything of that nature. It could well be. I didn't consider it uh, when I did this research. I looked at it more broadly, philosophically, discursively. But you know, W, this is a wonderful idea. And it brings me back to emoji studies, which I was hoping to leave behind. <laughs> For a little bit, you know, there comes a time, so it's done, let me move on to something else. But this is something fascinating in itself, how emoji-based uh, zodiac signs may be uh, generating a, a kind of subtext to the uh, messages and to Gen Z's uh, view of the world. Very fascinating uh, uh, question. Thank you, for W. Okay, thank you very much, Marcel. Um, I believe that comes to the end of our um, our proceedings today. I just wanted to thank everybody, uh, including um, our great Zoom master, um, Zignivi uh, Robuska, whose thank name <laughs> I'm butchering once again, and of course, Paul Boysack, who's the convener of this series. I just wanted oh. to do mention, very quickly mention that I'm co-founder of an, of an organization called Semiofest, a celebration of semiotic thinking, which focuses on the application of semiotics to uh, outside field, potentially brands, marketing and communication. We run monthly sessions on Zoom. and We have our face-to-face -face event in Porto, Portugal, happening on the 20, from the 22nd um, to the 24th of May. So um, Paul was uh, um, uh, happy for me to share that. Um, I don't know what the next session is for Smart Semiotics, but I'm sure Paul will be sharing that online and in the um, various social media channels. He's very, uh, the Semiotics Bulletin has notion, has um, regular updates and announcements on forthcoming sessions where um, they host Smart Semiotics and also on LinkedIn and other channels, I dare say fa Facebook. Um, so look out for that. And just thanks everyone for your attention. I'm going to post something about Semiofest now. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing everyone at the next session. Okay, everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Marcel particularly. Take care. Thank you, Marcel, again. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.